Now we're talking. Let's slow it down. Let's slow it way down. When you get to hell, tell them Daisy sent you. Come on, go! You don't die now! Welcome to Editors on Editing. I'm Glenn Garland. Fred Raskin has edited such cultural touchstones as three of the Fast and Furious movies, Guardians of the Galaxy, and Django Unchained. Now he has completed Quentin Tarantino's new western, The Hateful Eight. Fred, thank you so much for being here today. It's my pleasure. I really appreciate it. So, how did you get into uh, editing? So, I went to film school, and uh, I went to NYU, and I, I, I quickly learned that everyone, everyone goes to film school to become a director. So I was surrounded by, I don't know how many people, everyone was there to become a director. And, and so uh, midway through my, uh, my sophomore year there, when I saw how talented everyone was, I figured there's this slim possibility that I might not get a directing gig immediately upon graduation. So perhaps I should focus on a craft. And editing was always my favorite part of the process. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it really is the closest of the crew positions to directing, um, mm -hmm. you are you're still figuring out how to tell the story visually. You're still crafting performances, um, and you don't have to deal with elements like weather or mm -hmm. crew people or cast people who are being difficult. <laughs> like none you of have that. What you like have. <laughs> you can do it all from the comfort of an air conditioned room. And you worked with uh, Sally Mankey. What was that like? And what were some of the uh, things that she mentored you? Uh, well, Sally was great at first worked with Sally on uh, two movies that Billy Bob Thornton directed, mm. um, Daddy and Them and All the Pretty Horses, um, and then the, the Kill Bills came after that. So I learned a whole lot about how an editing room works, how you treat your assistants, how you, uh, like how you involve them in the process um, through Sally. Um, she, she was very inclusive in, in, in everything. Uh, whenever she finished a scene, she would bring us in and, uh, and, and sit us down and get our thoughts. Like for On All the Pretty Horses, she would give me scenes to cut. She then did her pass on it and she called me and she said, this is what I changed and this is why I changed it. That was again, a great learning experience. Sure, because then you know exactly what she's thinking and mm -hmm. why she thought, let's play that line on this person because it's important or let's play it off that person for a good reason. Yeah, no, it was it was a terrific learning experience from my perspective and, and something that, that I've kind of tried to do with my own assistance going forward. That's great. Um, but then, then working on Kill Bill, those movies were a complete thrill. Talk about, it's, it's exactly my kind of movie. Um, it, it's, it's a director who I could not admire more. And, and, and Quentin was equally inclusive. Like he was really excited about wanting to show us the material that, that, mm -hmm. that they'd been working on, um, and and he'd bring everybody in at once, and and uh, was just super enthusiastic about not only showing the material but also getting our thoughts afterward. That's great, um, and it's something that I've kind of learned working with him that the more you have to say, the better he's going to feel about everything. Like even if even if you're being critical, and so you uh, don't feel like oh, I can't say anything because I, I'll be judged. Or... Yeah, exactly. No, he, he's, he's never that way. Um, he, he's really, really open uh, about criticism. What's your process working with him, and how does it vary with other directors? Quentin is fairly unique, as far as my own experience is concerned, in that we'll be working together for, I, I don't know, eight, ten hours a day, and, and then he does, he does something remarkable. You're going to react in shock when I tell you this. Um, Quentin will go home and we'll watch the dailies for the scene that we're going to tackle the next day. Oh. And he'll watch it with a notepad in his hand. And he will take really, really thorough notes where he's written down what his like two or three favorite performances were of any given line. Um, oh, wow. So that when we're watching the cuts, we'll get to that point and it's like, okay, let's watch both of these, these two, let's watch these two takes and see what's really the, 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 the best performance. And it's encouraging to me when I've used 
the ones that sure. uh, <laughs> that he wanted me to use. <laughs> um, it's uh, yeah. There's nothing worse than when a director's like, "Why didn't you use that take?" I'm like. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. There's plenty of that also. <laughs> there are plenty of times where I find myself like, really? How did I do that? Like, of course that's what I should have used. Mm -hmm. um, if I've done something completely different, um, he's actually really open to that. So it's not, he'll take these notes, but it's not like it's written in stone that you have to use it. It's not, not, more not about like, this is what I felt, mm -hmm. but I want to see what, what your perspective is. Yeah. If he likes what he sees better, um, he's certainly not going to let his ego get in the way. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, like he, he, he'll, he'll go with what works best. That's fantastic. There's no greater thrill than showing him something. Uh, I mean, uh, understanding the level of respect that I have for him. Uh, like as I, I, I'm a guy who went to see Reservoir Dogs in the theater on opening weekend. I went with three of my closest friends and we walked out of the theater saying like, well, this is the most exciting voice in cinema to come along in decades. Sure. And you mentioned uh, Ultra Panavision uh, 70 millimeter. Did that pose any different challenges editorially? I think one of the things that we found, and this was kind of what I wasn't fully prepared for, was the one to 2.76 compositions I was gonna say gorgeous. with close-ups too, it's I tricky. mean, frequently you have close-ups and wide shots in the same shot. So between these beautiful frames, I mean, Bob Richardson really just knocked it out of the park. His lighting and these compositions all together, it was, uh, we're, we're, we're looking at paintings um, all day long. Even like wide shots in this movie, you can really see the, the, the depth of the actor's performances in their eyes like, uh, we found ourselves cutting a lot less I was gonna than ask, we would have Do you feel otherwise. like then you can slow down the pace because there's so much more information? Certainly the pace of the editing, yes. You know, fr frequently uh, the, the, the question wasn't what are we going to cut to next, it's are we even going to cut at all? And it, it actually became sort of the challenge was if we're going to cut, we'd better have a damn good reason for doing so. Just, just to give you an example, um, the sequence with Daisy playing the guitar. I was gonna say, um, that's a long, you hold on that tape for so like two or three minutes. It, uh, I, I think it's about four and a half actually. Wow. Um, yeah, she's playing the guitar and the guys are coming in in the background. I um, had no idea because it's so much is going on that yeah. you're not bored. It, it, it lulls you in and you have all this different information to look at. And Quentin shot coverage on, on that scene. I was gonna ask. Um, but when we watched the shot in the 70s, it was like, why? Why would we cut? Well, almost um, she's seducing them to the coffee in a way. Uh -huh. So to see the coffee and see her expression, waiting to see whether they're going to pour it for each other, whether they're going to drink, it was great. But here's the interesting thing about it. So that's how it plays in the 70 millimeter Roadshow release. Um, in the multiplex version of the movie, we did use some of the coverage. Um, it doesn't all play out in that one shot because Quentin's feeling was it holds in 70. Mm. But if you're not watching it in 70, um, we don't have to be quite as precious about it. And what was it like working with Marconi? <laughs> that must have been amazing. It, it was a complete and total thrill. Marconi was given a copy of the screenplay translated into Italian, and he wrote the score uh, almost entirely based on uh, just his reading of the script. He Is just that had how he this. always works, or at at the time anyway. Uh, he told Quentin, "Listen, I have a little bit of time, not too much, but I have an idea in my head for a theme, and I've written about ten minutes worth of music, and I'd love to record it." And then Quentin saw him a couple days later, and he's like, "Yeah, I've I've written some more." <laughs> <laughs> I kind of started writing and I kept writing. And from what I'm told, the legend is that rather than, than, than composing uh, on, on a piano or on a guitar, and, like he literally just sits at his desk and hears it in his head and writes it down. Wow. Um, so one of, one of the great thrills of my life was we were a, a few weeks into editing the movie and Quentin said, we're gonna go to Prague to watch the Prague Philharmonic Orchestra record Morricone's score oh, for The Hateful Eight. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and did he conduct? I was expecting him to, but, but, but what he actually did, and this was one of, it was just an amazing thing to witness. So as the orchestra is playing, Morricone has all of his pages of sheet music and he's following along. And if he hears something that he doesn't like, 
he stops the orchestra and sings the melody into the microphone as he would like it to be performed. Wow. And then the orchestra plays what he has just sung. It was an amazing thing to witness. I mean, talk about bona fide genius on a level that I can't even really comprehend. And then how did you treat the music when you had it? Did you, were, was it like this, this is going here and this goes here? Or did he give you a lot of music and then you and Quentin sort of parsed it out wherever you felt it? So the process on Quentin's movies normally goes like this. As he's writing, he has certain uh, score cues in mind from uh, movies that he loves. He has Ooh. this room full of vinyl albums um, and he'll go in there and, and he'll have just like, I need something that has this mood and he'll listen to it. And, and this happens during the writing process and it happens a little more once we get into editing. Let's see how this cue plays against the scene. Let's see how mm -hmm. this cue. So that's, that's how we did things on Django. Um, on this movie, he basically did the same thing but using the Hateful Eight score um, a, as uh, like this is the library from which he's I pulling. See. In addition to that, you know, Morricone wrote the score to John Carpenter's The Thing, but Carpenter only used two of the tracks that he wrote. And Morricone said to, to Quentin, feel free to use any of that that you'd like. Mm. Um, obviously, thematically, there, there are some strong similarities between the two movies. Um, and so it wasn't really a surprise at how well some of that stuff worked. There's that sad song that plays when uh, Joe Cage goes uh -huh. to the wounded man. That was that was a beautiful piece. That That's uh, and that song is from Last House on the Left, actually. Wow. <laughs> um, written by the star of that movie. He he wrote the songs in the movie also, and and that particular song was one that Quentin had kind of envisioned using wow. in this movie for that scene. And and yeah, I mean that's that's a perfect example. It kind of laid in exactly as he intended it to. Uh -huh. um, we really didn't have to do much in the way of adjusting after we laid it in, and then we were just kind of like, wow, well that's just great. And then there's a couple instances where you guys cut off the music hard. Ain't no way I'm spending a couple of nights under a roof with somebody I don't know who they are. Well, that's a, a, a kind of Quentin's taste, is to use things like door slams or even reel breaks to just end a cue. There's the White Stripes cue that's playing on the close-up of Daisy in the stagecoach that literally is ended by a reel break. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it just cuts off there. Um, it's this kind of lo-fi stuff that I think really appeals to Quentin. Well, it um, also keeps you on your toes. Yeah. It, um, it, it, you know, you really pay attention because it's like, oh, that... I wasn't expecting <laughs> Part of Quentin's idiosyncratic nature <laughs> that I really enjoy. <laughs> so the scenes in the carriage, tell me about editing those together because it's got amazing dialogue, but they're they're locked in one place and trying to keep that interesting and paced up. I see you ain't got mixed emotions about bringing a woman to a group. By woman, you mean her? No, I do not have mixed emotions. Get in, so you're taking in the Red Rock to hide. You bet. You gonna wait around and watch it? Oh, you know I am. Not an easy thing for our location sound mixer, Mark Ilano, um, <laughs> or our, our supervising sound editors, Wiley Statement and Harry Cohen, because uh, the noise of the truck that's pulling the stagecoach, not to mention the mm. wind and the, the elements, like, uh, it, it, was, it was a real challenge for those guys. And you were able to preserve a lot of the dialogue, not do ADR? Oh, th there's, yeah, no, th that one of Quentin's mandates is no ADR. The performance that came on the day is really really specific and getting ADR to match that usually sounds phony. Mm -hmm. So Quentin does not want to be on the ADR stage at yeah. all if it can be avoided. <laughs> Tell me about editing a movie where there's no clear protagonist. Quentin talked to me about this early on in terms of the first big chunk of the movie. We're introduced to all these new people one at a time generally and as the new characters are introduced Quentin made it a point to keep them at a distance. We don't see John Ruth for a while in that first scene. Mm -hmm. Like we, we, he, we see his arm holding the gun sticking out, we hear his voice, but we don't see him. When we're introduced to Chris Mannix, we just see him in the distance holding the, the, the lamp. We don't get a good look at his face until he's kind of right up close mm -hmm. with them. Um, and the idea was pre each scene where our protagonists are the people who we've met already whether or not they're good guys or not. They're who we're going we're to be aligned with, with uh -huh. um, visually. Um, and everybody else is kind of at a distance until we get a better handle on who they are. One of them fellas 
is not what he says he is. What is he? In cahoots with this one, that's what he is. And it works because John Ruth, he's very concerned about anybody taking his bounty. So, exactly. You know, it, it, he, it, he wants to keep everybody at a distance. It helps toward creating the, the atmosphere of paranoia. Mm -hmm. um, Quentin was very clear about making sure we held on moments of Bob, like if Bob didn't know something that he should have known. If you go back and watch the movie, you'll, you'll gain a new appreciation for that stuff. Well, I noticed even like in a, in a second viewing when John Ruth is talking about somebody's in cahoots with Daisy. Are you sure you ain't just being paranoid? Our best bet is this duplicitous fella and his cool of customers, Daisy here. He won't have the leather patience it takes to just sit here. You've got shots of Bob going yeah, to the fireplace. Mm -hmm. He's trying to keep busy, but first viewing, I just thought he was just manning, you know, manning minis, doing, right. doing his thing. That's but, the idea. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell me about the flashback. You start to see pictures, ain't you? This is, this is an interesting tidbit that kind of gets into spoiler territory. The way the movie plays out right now is, is basically how it played out in the screenplay. Um, but we did try one thing um, during the editing process, which was showing the poisoning of the coffee during the scene I where Warren is confronting that. Smithers. I was going to ask you about whether that was, whether you replayed it originally or whether that was done at the time. It appears in the movie the way it was written, and that's, that's how it was shot to be. But we did try a version where we see that happen during the confrontation, mm. um, with the idea being like, we see that happen and we see Daisy seeing it happen. And then we go back to the end of, of the scene with what happens between Warren and Smithers. The idea behind it was we're setting up what's going to happen in the next act of the movie. Mm -hmm. They're gonna go into the intermission knowing like, uh-oh. Something's happened. Now we know wh where the movie is going. Sure. But we found that it really diluted the impact of the Warren Smithers confrontation. I can imagine. Um, I mean, when, when Bob closes the piano and, and it cuts to intermission, like, it, it feels pretty great. And it, it, you, you, there's kind of an audible reaction from the audience. I, I don't know if it's exactly relief well, or... Well, the Smithers <laughs> thing is, is a big enough, you know, yeah. ending. <laughs> I love how Smithers doesn't say anything. You just have these reactions on him and he's just, he's speechless. Mm -hmm. Quentin, his, his MO generally is whatever character is talking, that's the character we're seeing on screen. Um, but he said in this movie, because so many of the characters are pretending to be something they're not, um, or uh, know something that someone else doesn't, Quentin said, he's used more reaction shots in this movie than in all of his other movies combined. Mm -hmm. C certainly, the, the, the Smithers confrontation is a fine example of that because, uh, because yeah, at a certain point, um, the, the, the weight of what's being said to him is too great for him to have an Absolutely. actual audible reaction. That's, that's my favorite sequence in the movie. Well, as the um, audience, you're, you're really sort of not sure what to believe and what not to believe. After the Lincoln letter, as an audience, we're, we're with John Ruth going, wow, he, he got a letter from Lincoln. And then, you know, he's like, no. So you don't, <laughs> you know, you don't have a reliable narrator. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's, that's one, of the, one of the things that I really like about the movie in general is the number of things that are left ambiguous that are up to the audience to, uh, to, to, to decide what's true and what isn't. Because the whole story that Warren is telling um, could be real, or it could be a complete fabrication. Like, both versions work. Sure. Um, and I really like the fact that it's never spelled out for you. It, it, this probably does impact how much you like Warren. Um, if he's making it up, um, yeah. um, it's, it's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> he's telling the truth. Oh, uh, yeah. he's pretty messed up, this guy. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> well, it's a really tricky movie because there is so much dialogue and trying to keep all the scenes all the dialogue scenes fresh, even though the dialogue is fantastic. My bounties never hang, because I never bring them in alive. Keeping it fresh and also being stuck in one room because of the blizzard, it's a it's huge challenge editorially. I, I mean, Quentin's dialogue kind of plays like action. If the relatives 
and the loved ones of the person you murdered were outside that door right now, and after busting down that door, they drug you out into the snow and hung you up by the neck, that would be frontier justice. We actually have that slow-mo dialogue beat um, that comes uh, later on in the movie. Let's slow it down. Let's slow it way down. I'd, I'd had my assistants slow the dialogue down uh, for, in syncing up the dailies so that we could watch it all in slow-mo. Um, in the action stuff, it kind of makes sense. I think usually the process is to, to bring the actors back in and have them loop the lines um, with them kind of slowing their own voices down. Mm -hmm. in, in this case, we really just slowed down the original performances, and that's and what's in the movie. did you use a special type of uh, processor to do that? Uh, time compression expansion. So it like was in the Avid. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, some of it is the Avid processing, and, uh, and other stuff, they, they did some other tricks to it, um, depending on how much metallic breakup we kind of got in, mm -hmm. in, in the slowed down material. So Quentin called me after watching Sam's dailies and said, you know how in like a Peck and Paul movie, you'll have the heroes will be in regular speed and they'll be shooting and the bad guys will get shot in slow-mo and you go back to the hero and then you go back to the, to, to, to the bad guy falling slow. What if we tried that with dialogue? Cool. And, I, and I said, that's a really neat idea. Let's mm -hmm. give it a shot. And, and, and so we started doing it and completely fell in love with it. I like the slow-mo gun fights too. They're, uh... Some of the sound work in there was really cool. Yeah, th th I, I have to give our re-recording mixers, Mike Minkler and Chris Minkler, some credit there because when, when we did it in the Avid, we had no music at all. Um, and uh, we had lots of slow-mo sound effects. And Mike Minkler said, if we could just put in like one, one or two notes of music in this, It'll give it more of an ethereal feel. Um, and we tried it and we were all kind of like, wow, that's great. I love the introduction of the four passengers. That whole sequence with the music is just amazing. And also, you guys really stretched it out right there. And then when the, when the attack happens, it's explosive. It's, <laughs> it's just like, bam, bam, bam. And you're like, wait, what, what happened? I will say probably the most challenging sequence for me as an editor was the sequence preceding the massacre um, because thanks to the one to 2.76 aspect ratio. You were seeing. You're seeing, we like to refer to each member of the gang as being in their own tableau. Mm -hmm. And frequently you're seeing another character's tableau in the background mm. of any given shot. So, uh, so we had to be very cognizant of who was where at what point in their action. Yeah. And we ended up cutting, there was a big subplot uh, in the screenplay that's completely excised from the movie where um, Charlie, the guy who gets shot in the shed, went down in the basement to take care of some of the rats and all of that had to go. But that meant that all of the timing involved in all of the other sequences was gonna get thrown off. So then did you do some split screens or? Quentin doesn't like doing split screens and it like, especially with this movie where it was shot in 70 and we're doing a photochemical finish, anytime we could avoid messing with the negative, mm -hmm. um, we would avoid messing with the negative. So split screens were not seen as an option. Mm -hmm. um, it was really- Make it work without let's, it. Yeah, yeah do, do what we can with the footage that we have. Sure. There's a lot of tension when we hear the voices that we had heard earlier played outside and were inside. And it's interesting that we're always seeing things from like these perspectives that we sort of already had, but from a different point of view. In the screenplay, that sequence continues beyond John, Ruth, and Daisy coming in. You see that entire next scene, you see that whole scene from the Domingue gang's perspective. Interesting. And when we laid the sound in for their arrival, we kind of realized, you know what, we've kind of done the alternate perspective already the ending just was was great i didn't uh, really didn't know you know how it was going to be resolved it, it, it was a lot about kind of putting putting ourselves in the head of the audience is chris mannix going to betray major warren because certainly we know from chapter 2 that these two guys hate each other mm -hmm. um, but now they kind of have a common enemy but will that common enemy be enough 
Sure. Or is Chris Mannix going to fall back on his old ways? I mean, even <laughs> at the end, you don't you, you don't know. I no, mean, uh, they, they. I love how it's open ended. Yeah, that's that's one of the. What's fun... going to happen? You know, you, you you don't know, and I almost feel like Maddox because he appreciates the man and his intelligence. He sort of starts overlooking his color, which I think is what I think Quinn set out to do with this. It's, oh, absolutely! It's, it's almost like a more modern take on on race relations and and Completely. how people. Mm -hmm. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed the movie. Thank you so much for being here. Today. Oh, it's my pleasure. What make a man brave a blizzard? Kill in cold blood? I'm sure I don't know. You'd be surprised what a man would do. <laughs> you start to see pictures, ain't you? Thank you.